A warm welcome to you on the gavel. I'm Linda Kibi. The House of Representatives waded into the impending industrial action by the Academic Staff Union of Universities, ASU. ASU had given the federal government a three weeks ultimatum to address all issues in the December 2020 agreement. Now, the Speaker of the House of Representatives, Mr. Femi Bajabi Amila, met with officials of the union to resolve the issues. And the union and the federal government have agreed to renegotiate the initial agreement on the university's revitalization fund. Now, Mr. Bajabi Amila says the House will be involved in the renegotiation process to ensure that the concrete agreement is reached, which will be beneficial to all parties and avert any further strikes. The House of Representatives has waded into the impending industrial action by the Academic Staff Union of Universities, ASU. ASU has given the federal government a three weeks ultimatum to address all issues in the December 2020 agreement. The House knows with dismay. Raised as a motion of urgent public importance, lawmakers are worried that the recurring strikes will encourage brain drain and capital flight. The Ministry of Education is saying we don't handle money. It is Ministry of Finance. But ASU is under the Ministry of Education and it has a responsibility to discuss with finance to ensure that these things are paid. They said the money is there to pay for the revitalization of universities across board. Vice chancellors have come here to defend their budgets and proposals on this revitalization already. They said the money is there to pay and allowances that is in the central bank. What is holding it between the federal government and the central bank, I do not know. So all I'm asking, dear colleagues, is let us beg the federal government to live up to expectation and implement an agreement is signed without duress. Lawmakers want the matter treated urgently. Why shouldn't we take the bull by the horn, having regard to the problem, and then deploy enough resources this is not issue of I am right or I am wrong. Even the Bible says that it is wrong for you to make a vow and not keep to it. It's better that you don't. For the fact that they have agreed and they came with this agreement, those agreements should be simply followed to the letter. Let the Committee on Education, Tertiary and Basic, confirm or investigate the reasons why there is a continuous and several breach of this agreement and report back to the House within one week. Following the motion in the Green Chamber, the Speaker of the House of Representatives met with the Minister of Finance and that of State for Education, as well as the Academic Staff Union of Universities, ASU. The meeting is an intervention by the House to avert an impending strike by the Academic Union over what it describes as a breach of agreement by the federal government. One of the issues in contention is a revitalization fund agreement, which the federal government is unable to meet. It was agreed that the federal government will release 1.2 trillion naira to the educational sector over a period of six years. And how did we arrive at 1.3 trillion? When we filled the agreement, government doubted that what was in the agreement was not that the university was not as rotten as was indicated in that agreement. And the government then set up a team to visit all the universities and come up with the and the outcome indicated that the federal government should give 1.3 trillion, 1 trillion out to the federal university alone. There were about 24 universities, about 24. Now they are 40 something. Based on that report. It was agreed at that meeting with that the president then, Yulogu Jonathan, on how the money will be released. In 2013, it was supposed to release 200 billion, 2014, 220 billion, 2015, 2016, 2018, 220 billion. The first one was released, although we have question on how it was released, because we found out later that it will take it for pet funds and not from the government. So the first one was released, and that was the end. There might be also a need to sit back and look at a long-term view because 1.3 trillion is a very large amount of money to raise. Even at 200 billion per annum, it's very large. We're really constrained now publicly. So we need to revisit that and we need to look at what is practically possible to do, even though there was commitments from 2009, then 2013. But the situation physically now is not the same as it was at that time. So please, I want to appeal to uh, the leadership of ASU 
uh, as uh, citizens of this country to reconsider the issue of going for strike. All this renegotiation you're talking about, you're talking about money. And the Committee on Education has to be involved. So the Committee on Education will work with the, with the ministry, uh, Honor Minister, correct? Uh, and um, for the renegotiation, and they will get back to you on that. But that is not the one that will delay. So, uh, Mr. President, sir, are we on the same page? Yes, sir, but we need to have some time for the ministry. They said one week. Meanwhile, the 22 billion naira earned allowances and salary shortfall for members of the union is one issue which ASU insists cannot be negotiated. Money is not in our cost today, it's in the cost of millions of us. So, so normally we give them a schedule like this with the universities, how many, that's, it's, and that's what I said earlier, that there is no disagreement with that. That will reach you, it has reached Minister of Finance today, so by, maybe by Monday they should start working on the end allowance part. ASU had insisted that it would not be part of the federal government's integrated payroll and personnel information system, IPIS and had developed its own payment system, UTAS, which it says is much safer in comparison. We have the issue with IPs. As you speak so, according to our IPs document, which we just got today, up to 11, 12, 14, 15 months salary of our members have not been paid. This is our document. Have not been paid. So if a lecturer has not been paid for 13 months, I would say that that particular uh, IPs is sound, it is error proven free and you cannot pay salary. Some will pay four months, they will stop. They pay two months and stop and what have you. They are even no, acknowledging that there are the people that pay double salary. Because of this, we said, we will produce a system that will capture all the peculiarity in university in 2014. And we were challenged in 2020 that we should produce one, which we did. Within four months, we demonstrated this to the office of the Senate president here. And it was not forted. We demonstrated this to the office of the accountant general in, her, in his office. It was not forted. We demonstrated to the vice chancellors and registrars. It was not forted. When this IP came to this country from outside, was imported, was it tested by NIDA to know whether it is sound, uh, error proof? They said no. So the one that came from outside, you refused to test and you started applying. But the one generated within, you said you must, you must test. And to test it, it's taking almost a year, they cannot test it, which means it is a deliberate thing. This, this is a system that we bought, that we inherited, but we have been able to refine it. HP, that used to be the original vendor, has left, and now it's a Nigerian company that is running the, the place. So if the university system, in its wisdom, wants a new system, so be it. But please, let us not say that IPPI is as, uh, in, in that kind of bad light that you are putting it. The system is working very well. And it's serving government well. The meeting ended without a commitment from ASU to suspend the planned strike. The speaker, however, assured Nigerians that the ICT and education committees of the House would follow up on the areas of disagreement. The Senate Committee on Judiciary held an interesting public hearing during the week on a bill for an act to amend the Legal Education Consolidation Act, which proposes to increase the number of the Nigerian law school campuses in the country from 6 to 12 to improve access for law graduates. The crowd at the public hearing was an indicator of the significance of the subject matter, which drew a diverse group of interested parties who spoke passionately in support or against the increase in the number of Nigerian law school campuses in the country. The Senate Committee on Judiciary organized this public hearing to get the input of concerned Nigerians in three bills, namely the Legal Practitioners Act Repeal and Reenactment Bill, the Legal Education Consolidation Amendment Bill, and the Legal Aid Council Amendment Bill. But the most contentious is the Legal Education Consolidation Bill seeking to establish six additional campuses of the Nigerian Law School in Kabakugi State, Meiduguri in Bronu, Arugungu in Kebi, Okija in Anambra, Orogun in Delta State, and Ifaki Law School Campus in Ikiti State. All of this will be in addition to an already approved law school campus built in Port Harcourt by the River State Government. I decided to sponsor this bill based on my personal experience, uh, encounter of my children when they were to go to law school some three years ago. For one whole year, they were at home. And 
The reason was, there's not just a place for them to go for law school. I hold the view that if, as a senator, my children cannot easily get admission, then what happened to less privileged Nigerians? But former Deputy well, Senate President Ike Kweremadu wants against any arrangement to politicize the establishment of law schools, insisting it should be left to the Council for Legal Education to decide. We must be able to take a decision that the issue of law school, should be, the establishment of more law schools should be left at the hands and discretion of the Council of Legal Education. But his position does not sit quite well with some of the lawmakers. You are saying we should all eat together. You have, I do not. And you say it's well. How can it be well? All the people that have, that have spoken against the establishment of these law schools all have law schools established in their states. And that is to say that all of us know that we need these institutions. I am wondering, in the House of Reps and in the Senate, 70% of the people who are there are lawyers. What would have happened if they didn't have the opportunity of attending law schools? The president of the Nigerian Bar Association and chairman, Council of Legal Education, are not in support of the amendment. However, a senior lawyer presents a different perspective. Some news reports have put the cost of constructing the new campuses that we are proposing at 32 billion naira, if that is to be believed. I would say that if this sum is ploughed into the targeted infrastructure progress in the already existing campuses of the Nigerian Law School, we will do, we'll do much more and we'll make better use of it than to create new law schools. The uh, Council of Legal Education, without a convocation, is opposed to this bill. The reason why we're opposed to the bill is that it is within the power of the Council of Legal Education to create campuses. If you're also going to have a multi-campus system, because we're all talking about federalism, we must also tax the state government in each of the geopolitical zones to also contribute to the development of the law school. Because we are training lawyers that will be their own, they are their own students, I mean their own children. The Senate Committee on Judiciary is expected to collate the views expressed at this hearing and present a report which will be tabled before the Senate at plenary. Meanwhile, the House of Representatives Committee on Judiciary is conversing for security for judicial officers to avoid the repeat of the siege on the residence of Supreme Court Justice Miri Odili. The chairman of the committee, Onofio Kluk, stated this during the budget defense session of the National Judicial Council. The committee is concerned that actions like that could weaken the morale of judicial officers. Meanwhile, the committee wants an intervention fund created for the judiciary to upgrade in line with international best standards. Different sectors of the economy have had intervention fund. Uh, the, we had intervention fund for sport. We have had intervention fund for youth. We have had intervention fund for entertainment. I don't think that it would be out of place for the federal government to have an intervention fund for the judiciary. Of great importance to this committee is the issue of security of our judicial officers. We have stated as a committee, and then we want to restate here again, that we should create an enabling environment, not only the working environment, not only a living a good living condition, but a secured environment for our judicial officers to operate without let or hindrance, without any fear of intimidation or harassment. That is why we want to use the opportunity and condemn the, um, um, the attack and, uh, on uh, the Justice Honorable um, Justice Mary O'Dilly, uh, the Justice of the Supreme Court, and then we ask that this should not repeat itself. It happened in 2018. I think 2017 too, this should not be allowed to repeat itself because we are weakening the morale and the strength of our judicial officers. Hey, welcome back to the gavel. Let's take a look at some of the key happenings in the Senate and House of Representatives during the week. A bill to ensure provision of free health care for all children in the country has scaled second reading in the House of Representatives. 
According to the bill, the service shall be rendered by government hospitals and shall cover referrals from other hospitals. The bill also states that the Ministry of Health shall be responsible for its implementation. The bill when passed into law shall ensure that all healthcare services delivery to child in Nigeria shall be free and it will give the following unique and immediate benefit to the children, Mr. Speaker. The healthcare service shall include diagnosis, treatment, prevention of illness and other physical and mental apartment in children in Nigeria. The service shall be rendered by the government hospital, Mr. Speaker, in Nigeria. The service shall cover referral cases of children from other state, local government hospital, or any other private hospital in Nigeria. Mr. Speaker, monitoring and implementation of the bill is to ensure implementation of this act upon commencement of the Federal Ministry of Health shall make definite procedures, guidelines, as well as monitor and implement the provision of this act, coordinate free health care service delivery to these children in Nigeria and ensure transparency and accountability in the free health care service delivery. The managing director of the Federal Airport Authority of Nigeria, Rabiu Yadudu, says it is difficult to enforce FANS regulations because of armed security agents who repeatedly assault officials of FAN. The FAN MD also pointed out that the challenges at the airport could be linked to the multiplicity of agencies present. He says the presence of numerous agencies contributes to corruption at airports. Mr. Yadudu stated this during an interaction with the Speaker of the House of Representatives and some committee chairmen on the state of a country's airports, such as malfunctioning air conditioning units, escalators, operational inadequacies, complaints of harassment and extortion. He further says that international passengers don't require more than 45 minutes to conclude their boarding processes, but this is complicated and extended for up to two hours because of the presence of too many agencies at the airports. Recently, we have more than three attacks on our personnel by the Nigerian Customs Service because they are armed. I will also add that most of our challenges are with the armed agencies. The ones that are not armed are easier to control, to listen and obey the standard and recommended practices. Two of them at access points to enter the Hajj and Cargo Terminal. Officers of the Nigerian Customs refused to come down and be screened. And when they were, when our personnel, the aviation security insisted, they came down and assaulted aviation personnel. That is fun stuff. And we have many more instances on the customs and the other agencies. Another one I do remember is that with the Nigerian police, last year a very important VIP came to the airport in the same Lagos. They were going through the wrong access route and they were stopped. And they just stopped, came out, started beating up the security, aviation security that were telling them this is the wrong route. I believe what is also adding to this is our problem of having too many agencies. When we have 15, 10 agencies doing the same thing, I think it also opens the door for violations. It opens the door for corruption. The Senate has resolved to investigate the gas explosion in Ladipo, Mushin area of Lagos, which killed five people and injured 10 others. The upper chamber is therefore mandating its committees on petroleum downstream and gas to urgently investigate the remote and immediate causes of the explosion and report back to the Senate to prevent future occurrences. The Senate's resolutions follow a motion by a federal lawmaker from Lagos, Senator Solomon Adiola. The upper chamber is also directing the National Emergency Management Agency, NEMA, and the Federal Ministry of Humanitarian Affairs to immediately send relief materials to affected victims and offset medical bills of hospitalized victims. The explosion caused no fewer than five deaths, comprising of three adults male, a woman, and a 10-year-old boy. There has been a reoccurrence of this similar explosion in recent time in the same area in my senatorial district as it happens in 2016, 2018, 2019, 2020. And the Senate Committee on Downstream Gas to investigate the remote immediate causes of this explosion and report back same uh, in four weeks with a view to avoid future occurrence. On Saturday, November 13, General Zarma Zerkosu and four soldiers were killed by terrorists of the Islamic State West Africa province, Iswap, during an attack at Askira Uba local government area of Borno State. The Senate and the House of Representatives are honoring the brave soldiers during Tuesday's plenary session. In the Senate, 
the chairman of the Committee on Army, Senator Ali Ndumi, hails the deceased for their exceptional display of gallantry in the military's fight against terrorists in northeast Nigeria and describes the late Brigadier General Zirkusu as a gallant soldier who served and died for his fatherland. Iswab insurgents attacked Askira town and a general who was rushing to the scene was ambushed by Iswab and killed along with three soldiers. And that time and day two, Saturday, we also lost the two IC of the battalion operating in Askira. Senators rise to honor the gallant soldiers. The House of Representatives is also reacting to the killing of Brigadier General Zerma Zerkusu by ISWAP militants and directs its committees on army, intelligence and police affairs to investigate the upsurge in the attacks in the region. This war is not going to finish. We have to embark on offensive strategy by taking the war to their doorsteps so that we can destabilize them. They will not have the luxury of time the comfort of position to come and attack communities. Mr. President, Meanwhile, a federal lawmaker representing Taraba South, Senator Emmanuel Bwacha, is warning that Nigeria's territorial sovereignty is under threat following the invasion of Manga community in Takun local government area of Taraba State by Ambazonia separatists from southern Cameroon. This village came under attack by the Ambazonia forces or separatist movement from southwest Cameroon. And the village head and four others were killed in this attack. What is their motive is yet unknown. Whether they want to expand territory that they want to lay claim for in southwest Cameroon, we are not yet clear. Okay, go ahead. Meanwhile, the House of Representatives is to liaise with relevant government agencies and the Ministry of Foreign Affairs over the diplomatic impasse between Nigeria and the United Arab Emirates and its mistreatment of Nigerians by the UAE government. House Minority Leader Andude Lumelo in a motion draws the attention of his colleagues to the ban on visa and work permits by the UAE government against Nigerians. What you now find, Mr. Speaker, is that if you have to go to, for instance, India or Saudi, now passing through, you have to go to Ghana and now be stamped for 14 days to show that you have stayed in Ghana for 14 days before you can be allowed to transit through UAE. Or you go to Kenya or neighboring countries. And these are countries that used to look up to us for their survival. In sync with the House of Representatives, the Senate is also intervening in the diplomatic role between Nigeria and the United Arab Emirates following disagreements between both countries. In the course of Tuesday's plenary session, Senate Minority Leader Ainaya Abaribe recalls that in December 2020, a memorandum of understanding was signed between Nigeria and the UAE to provide a platform for both countries to engage each other bilaterally. However, he notes that the disagreement between both countries started over the method of COVID-19 testing for Nigerian passengers and degenerated to the cancellation of flights to and from Nigeria because of the disagreement between the Nigerian government and Emirates airline. For a concern that there are allegations that hundreds of legal resident Nigerians living in the UAE are now losing their jobs on account of the refusal of the authorities to renew their work permits, which offend the letters of the bilateral agreement between both countries that they have signed on to. The Senate, in a resolution, mandates its committees on foreign affairs, presidential task force on COVID-19, as well as national security and intelligence and interior to interface with the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and National Intelligence Agency on best ways of resolving this crisis and report back to the Senate within two weeks. This is where we call it a day on this week's edition of The Gavel. If you have any views on any of the issues discussed, please email us on thegavel at channelstv.com. Thank you for staying with us and see you again next week.